So, um, my name is Kevin Kuykendall. I'm a senior lecturer in the archaeology department at the University of Sheffield. Um, I'm a paleoanthropologist by research interest, um, and I've been working here at Creswell Crags since 2019. And I have a team of uh, students and uh, fellow researchers from the department, and also some volunteers from the area around Creswell Crags. I'm Dr. Teresa Nelson. I was a heritage facilitator here at Creswell Crags, also tour guiding. Um, and now I'm a research assistant with Creswell Crags as well as the University of Sheffield. And here at Creswell Crags, we have all kinds of history. So 120,000 years ago, way before people were here, we actually had hippo bones that were found here. And those have been found in Boathouse Cave as well as other places throughout the crags. And then let's fast forward to 60,000 years ago, around 35,000 to 60,000 years ago, we had Neanderthals here. In the 1860s, the fifth Duke of Portland owned this land and he thankfully prevented it from being destroyed by rail lines but he used this and he made this beautiful lake because he was trying to protect the crags and wanted to show off this beautiful landscape that we're in today but with that as the victorians like to do he did blow out some of the caves and the first one was boat house cave and when they blew it out they actually found lots of interesting remains coming out of there things that weren't here in the 1860s and weren't presently at england so with that they also blew out robin hood cave and they also blew out, blew out church hole cave and loads of remains coming out and neanderthal tools um, butchered bones also hyena bones hyenas chewing on bones these caves have been used for all sorts so i think in the 1940s and 30s people used to actually use them as bomb shelters we've always had people here we've had vikings here we've had romans here we've had modern peoples here there's always been someone here at the crags for the last 12,500 years and even though the populations have changed the meaning has changed as well but it's still this gorgeous place that it is that we like to it's almost like a sanctuary and it's always been that in some way for the last 12,000 years Um, how many of you are there here? It, it changes day by day, but we have a crew of usually about 10 to 12 on any given day. Um, and we have, at the moment, three different test pits that are being excavated, producing quite a lot of material for us. Uh, we had a technician out doing ground penetrating radar in some parts at the ends of the gorge and working with a couple of students for that. And then we have, as you can see behind us, a team of people working on the, the finds processing. So cleaning and, and sorting and, and cataloging all the material that we've recovered. So all in all, it's, it's quite a lot of work and we're, we're keeping very busy. We'll just like move over, move over to them. Hi, I'm Helen. I'm Kendall. I'm Tim. We are following up a little investigation which we began last year. We found several different soil deposits, at the bottom of which were a lot of bone shards and other bits and pieces on top of what looked like a buried soil. They might have been potentially prehistoric. So we've come back again this year and opened up a larger area and uh, we've, we've more or less found the same sort of thing. So we're going to take the sand off and then we'll reveal that, uh, that buried soil. But it is still giving us a, a, a decent viewpoint in, in broad terms of what's been going on in the general area. And it may well be that there was a... Um, there were hyenas um, in the area and they were eating, digesting um, bones. I, I've just found it really exciting. This is only the second dig that I've actually ever been on. Um, and so to be turning up things that are potentially 20, 30,000 years old and have been just buried there, just slightly beneath the surface, it's been pretty unbelievable, to be honest. Like every bucket we've been sieving has just had tons of material in there. So. Yeah, it's really exciting. Have you, have you found anything here? Um, we did find on, I believe it was Wednesday of last week, uh, a very nice little kind of disc-shaped stone tool. Uh, so I believe that's between 20 and 40,000 years old. Uh, so it was probably a Neanderthal, yeah, pretty old, probably a Neanderthal tool. Oh. Um, so that's quite cool. Actually, that's the first time I've ever found anything like that. Um, so we found that right actually from about here, if you can imagine, when the base of the trench was here in this kind of rich organic layer. Um So this is 
basically all the stuff that's been found from Creswell Crags that we have in the collections here. So we have stuff that was excavated from the 1970s onwards because the earliest stuff was excavated before we had a museum here. So I've got to put my gloves on. So we have evidence of humans here. These are what's known as debitage, so what has been broken off of flint while making stone tools. So these were found in Robin Hood Cave. And then we've got the nice stone tools that were created and also found in Robin Hood Cave. So wow. I love the colours on this one and how curved it is. How old is that? Um, I'd say late glacial, so it could be around about 14,000 years old. Oh. Or William Rhinoceros Tooth. Hyena poo. And it's, it's amazing how, like, not to diminish how important it is to find something, but just how much there is to be found. Mm. And all it takes is a dig occurring, doesn't it? And I think Kevin's yeah. approach is quite interesting because excavations have historically featured or focused on the caves or the spoil heaps that were ex yeah. dug out from previous excavations. But Kevin's looking at a more landscape approach and obviously people and animals wouldn't have used, just used the caves and sort of floated yeah. over to the next cave. They would have used the landscape as well. So it just needs the right preservation, preservation they conditions. Would have, yeah. and excavations to take place to be able to find things. So what is it that you're actually doing there then? Uh, well I'm here as a volunteer. What's the sound levels like then? The job I've been tasked to do for the moment is sieving these horizons that are coming out of the, the pit over there. Uh, so I'm just keeping my eye open just for anything really that, uh, that isn't the soil or the natural stone. Yesterday we decided we were going to put a, a test pit in here. So we've got a, a one metre square test pit in the entrance to the cave. We do recognise there's been some an old sewage works around here. So we're going to need to go an awful lot deeper than we are at the moment. We're probably at about yeah. 50 centimetres. We need to go at least a metre down. So for safety's sake, we've now, this morning, our job is to expand to the cliff walls. Yep. So uh, it gives a safer working environment clean down to the level we left it at yesterday which is just under the topsoil yeah, and 20 centimeters down we found an old Asda breakfast bar wrapper <laughs> but at the moment it is just purely junk and rubble uh, so we need to get through that before we can get into yeah into the good stuff is there anything uh, specifically uh, look at hoping to find today or? well I'm sure I'm hoping to find something really exciting like <laughs> yeah. a, like a, like a, a saber-toothed tiger or something yeah, yeah. but uh, no I'm uh, I'm keeping my expectations reasonable the purpose of the excavation is to work um, in areas outside of the caves and so what we're hoping to find is archaeological traces of human behavior of these hunting and gathering groups that were here between about 12,000 and 60,000 years um, and they included both Neanderthal populations and modern humans. Um, and so what we're interested in is basically the nature of their adaptation to the landscape, um, given that at, during that time frame the environment was changing and, and fluctuating rapidly. It's finished. Yes, yeah. it is. It is finished. We've got lots of cool stuff here as well. So right here is actually one of my favorite ones. is a rib bone, probably of a large mammal, and it has cut marks on it. Around this side you can see little cut marks that insinuates and tells us that someone was using something flint to remove meat off the bone. And then here we have um, some pieces of digested bone, so a hyena more than likely ate some pieces of bone from an animal. And then here, from the same trench, is what we think is copper light, so hyena copper light. So for those of you who do not know what a copper light is, it is fossilized poo. So hyenas are really amazing creatures and because their stomach acid can actually digest bone, because there's so much calcium in their poo, it fossilizes it. And these things are really useful for us because uh, we can learn about what plants were growing around. We can also see what the hyenas are eating. The best find of the whole dig. From Trench 13 is this beautiful ironstone scraper. 
right here. It's Mysterian, so it's at least 35,000 to 60,000 years old, made by a Neanderthal. And so they use the iron stone and they probably cut it in half or split it in half and they have little chips all over here so they were trying to turn it into a scraper. We have a hyena second premolar, the right hand side. Right here, so you can see the really, really thick root. Um, very different from other animal teeth, which I actually have another one right here. That looks better than my teeth. I know. Perfect. So we have a hyena incisor here, at least 35,000 years old. So this isn't from Neanderthal times, this is more recent. It's a Neolithic flint blade. And then of course we have some cool little things like this. We have loads and loads of the shell coming out in different areas and different places. There's a cat's eye from the road that used to be there. We had a marble, um, a coin from 1861. And yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Just like some, clo some, some closing words. There's just always been people here, and this is a really good one because it shows us that Neanderthals were definitely still here, and more importantly that there is still stuff to be discovered here at the crags, that there's still a lot of digging that we can possibly do, and there's still a lot of history here that we can still get into and learn about. So there's still so much more. Even though we do still do a lot of digging, there's still so much more that we can learn. So um, how, just like generally, like how important do you think uh, archaeology is to our species? As a whole massive question. That is a big question you've got but, me uh, thinking. That's a really interesting question, really important question I yeah. think as well, um, particularly in, in the environment where disciplines like humanities, which includes archaeology, are, are losing government funding and there's a, a real um, focus on things like science and technology and whatever, things that will better society and, and make our lives easier and so on. So the answer is, is kind of philosophical really and um, for me the the real attraction is that the more we understand the past and the past of our species, the better we understand who we are as a species. Well, I think we've got to understand where we came from, don't we? We can't just be focusing on the here and the now and the future. We've got to yeah. understand how we came to be and looking at what also happened. Like, we obviously didn't exist in a vacuum, we existed alongside other animals and the changes in environment and climate. and to be able to study that alongside archaeology is quite important to be able to see the impacts we're having now and maybe ways we Definitely. can mitigate some of the impacts if possible, hopefully. Yeah. Depending on your viewpoint, really just political, environmental and so on, you either believe that the, the environment is here for us to exploit and for us to use as, as we like, as much as we, as we want. Um, and that kind of attitude has actually led us to a, a point now where we're facing a real climate crisis. Um, and so, if we understand more about past adaptations and the way that past populations lived with the environment um, and actually lived in a way that ensured their survival over long periods of time, basically we need to redefine our relationship with, with our environment. And, and I think that archaeology is one discipline that can help us to do that because um, we have to go back and understand how populations without all of our technology um, were able to survive. It, it helps us to define ourselves as a species and as a society. And, and I think that right now we, we need to change the way we define ourselves in, in many ways. And it's, it's, it helps out. All right, that's great. Yeah. I, think, I think we're good. Yeah. Yeah, smashing. Nice questions, thanks. Oh, that's all right. Well, very, very lovely. All right.